All right, let's start. So I had some idea to give some very broad overview now of what we can do and what else can be done in vector valued analysis. But I didn't write out the notes for that broad overview. I just had a vague idea that I would do it, maybe improvise it and I'll give it a go. It's not necessarily going to be a good overview, but hopefully it makes a bit of sense. So what we've done up to now is looking at, you know, Barnack Valley functions, right? Like you, you've seen this so many times now, like you know what this is, you've got X is a Barnack space, X is a Barnack Valley function. You can't multiply vectors, things like that. You're used to this now, this is all good. So now when you're in an application and some natural circumstance means you have to think of a Barnack valued function, you'll be ready. You have some idea what to do. You know that you can do a fair bit of Barnack valued analysis. You've got LP spaces, you've got nice duality relations and Fourier transform, Fourier multipliers, things like this. This comes up a lot in PDEs, like where you're looking at functions already. Maybe they're in n plus one variables. One of those variables is time. So you consider it as a function of time with values in functions, right? It's just a Barnack value function. Now you know how to do that. These are the, I guess what you call natural applications where you naturally have Barnack value functions from the beginning and you find yourself having to consider a Barnack valued Fourier multiplier just naturally and it's all good. But you've also got some interesting, I guess you can call them unnatural applications where your problem has nothing to do with Barnack valued functions or maybe even nothing explicitly to do with Barnack spaces. But you can still reduce your problem down to Barnack valued analysis and use the tools we've learned. And I think these are the, the most interesting applications because the straightforward ones, they're, they're kind of straightforward. They're not surprising. They're important and they're useful, but not surprising. I like surprising applications more than the non-surprising ones. So this week, we're going to do a, a surprising application, which isn't really in an area that I have a lot of experience in. So my proofs might be a bit off, but none of this is examined, so it doesn't matter. So we're going to do some operator theory. Uh, let's take a Hilbert space H. By the way, we're doing operator theory on a Hilbert spaces. This is where you typically do operator theory. Like in a sense, there's only really one Hilbert space for every dimension. You know, you've got one separable infinite dimension of Hilbert space, but operator theory on this Hilbert space is still very hard. And there are a lot of difficult open questions in this operator theory, even though the the Barnack space is a Hilbert space is only the one. There's a lot of complexity in this problem. Let's take your Hilbert space. And let's consider a bounded linear operator, which we call U lowercase, because you want to think of these as vectors. So bounded linear operators. This is what L of H is. I've been using this notation all the time without really introducing it. And given an operator u, I mean, okay, you can ask a lot of questions about the operator u. What property does this operator have? Of course, if you don't specify what the operator is, you can't say anything, but you can start to define nice classes of operators you can work with. Uh, one way to measure the, the largeness of an operator. There's a really vague question. Is u large or how large is u? You can look, for example, at the operator norm of u and talk about how large that is, but you can do more refined things than purely looking at the operator norm. It's not the most interesting thing you can do. You can ask about whether or not U is compact. People remember what compact operators are. I haven't formally made operator theory a prerequisite of this course, but compact operators send compact sets to pre-compact sets, sets whose closure is compact. In an infinite dimensional space, a closed and bounded set doesn't need to be compact, right? And generally a bounded operator will send a bounded set to a bounded set. Compact operators send compact sets to sets whose closures are compact. You might send them to open sets, right? They don't have to be closed, but when you close it, you get a compact set. So these are much stronger than bounded, right? They send a bounded set, which is quite big in an infinite dimensional space, essentially to compact sets, which is small. So you can ask whether the operator u is compact. So that says the operator u is in some sense small or controllable or something. But that's not a that's not really a, a quantitative thing you can ask for. 
quantitative properties being numerical, measurable, quantifiable properties. You can ask like, how compact is you? Oops, a sort of vague question. How compact is you in numbers, right? Let's try to measure how compact you is. So one way you can do this is through what are called the approximation numbers. These are also called singular values. If you know the singular value decomposition, that's where they come from. The approximation numbers of u are called a sub n of u. And these are defined to be the infimum of the norm of u minus v in the operator norm, where you look at all v such that the rank of v is less than n. So remember the rank of a linear operator is just the, dimen the dimension of the span of its range. Actually the dimension of its range, you don't need a span. So operators will send this infinite dimensional, let's say infinite dimensional. I should have specified that all along. So you have your infinite dimensional Hilbert space, you have an operator on it, it maps these infinite dimensions. Maybe it maps down just to n dimensions. This is a very small operator. This is essentially a finite dimensional operator. So for every n, you can look at this a sub n of u, which is actually the distance of u to the operators of rank less than n. And what you're asking for here is how well can you approximate this operator u by operators of rank less than n? That's why they're called the approximation numbers. Now, because I've got this condition that the rank of v here is less than n, it's not equal to n. You're actually looking at a larger set for every n. So if you take n to be really large, you're approximating by operators potentially a very large rank, but they could also be of small rank, which says you have some monotonicity here. The nth approximation number is greater than or equal to the n plus one approximation number for all n greater than or equal to one. I should have said this is for n greater than or equal to one. <laughs> so if you look at this sequence of approximation numbers, it's got some information about how small the operator u is. It says how well it can be approximated by rank n or rank less than n operators for every n. You've got this potentially decreasing sequence of approximation numbers. And if you look at how fast that sequence decays, you can say something about your operator. Maybe it's not finite rank, but it can be approximated by finite rank operators to a certain degree. And if that's really quick, if that decays very fast, you should think, okay, the operator is sort of small. Uh, I should say a couple of things about the approximation numbers. The approximation A1 is just the norm. So you know that if you start with a bounded operators, with a bounded operator, the approximation number is actually finite. That makes sense. You're always within finite distance of a finite rank operator. And I guess the important thing that I've been building up to is that if the approximation numbers converge to zero, as n goes to infinity, that says your operator sits in the closure of the finite rank operators in the operator norm. And if you know your operator theory, you know what this is. This is the set of all compact operators, which is usually denoted by k of h. So you've got this theorem for operators on Hilbert spaces. Every compact operator is the limit of finite rank operators. And conversely, every limit of finite, every finite rank operator is compact. And compactness is preserved by limits in the norm topology. So every limit of finite rank operators is compact. So yeah, the, the closure of the finite rank operators is exactly the compact operators. And the compact operators, that means, yeah, in terms of approximation numbers, it means your approximation numbers tend to zero. So you can phrase that condition as the sequence A sub whatever of U is in the Banach space C0 of the natural numbers, bounded sequences which converge to zero at infinity. So what this whole discussion suggests is that you can come up with interesting and useful classes of operators by imposing conditions on the approximation numbers of your operators.
And that leads us to a definition. For P between one and infinity, I'll say what happens for infinity, but I won't specify yet. The, the Shatten class, which has a bunch of different notations, we'll call it CP of H, because that's what's used in the book analysis in Barnack spaces, sometimes called SP of H, which maybe is a bit more natural. Is the set of operators you can probably guess the definition at this point because we're building up to it. It's a set of bounded operators U such that the approximation number sequence is an LP, the sequence space, little LP. And we define the Shatten P norm of your operator. But of course, it's the LP norm of the approximation number sequence. So you take this characterization of compact operators where you say the approximation number sequence is in C0 and you replace the Barnack space C0 with your favorite sequence space. You can do this with any space of sequences and it will give you a corresponding space of operators. Incidentally, I haven't defined C infinity. It's got two possible definitions that appear in the literature. One of them is just all of the bounded linear operators and one of them is all of the compact operators. So that's taking this model Barnack space here to be either L infinity or C zero, depending on whether you want your L, all of your Shatten classes to consist of compact operators or not. There are good reasons you'd want to do that, but either definition, both of them make sense. But we're not actually going to use C infinity in this discussion, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm not going to prove I'm actually not going to prove much about these spaces directly. I'm just going to state a bunch of properties and you can look up the proofs. They're sort of elementary from the point of view of operator theory. If you're good with operators, they should be easy. But let me just say, this is a Barnack space. I haven't proved completeness. I haven't proved that the norm is actually a norm. All of these things are fairly straightforward to do. So I was saying when I was introducing all of this stuff, maybe you're doing, you know, I wanted to be some surprising applications where maybe there's no Barnack space involved. When you talk about operator theory on a Hilbert space, in a sense, there's no Barnack space involved. There's a Hilbert space, but there's no real Barnack structures. But when you start looking at spaces of operators, Barnack spaces come back in. <laughs> so when you look at the Shatten classes, for example, they're not, they're generally not Hilbert spaces, they're Barnack spaces. So it's a Barnack space. Let's just state some properties very quickly. The Shatten classes are contained in the compact operators because if your approximation number sequence is in LP, then it has to tend to zero. That's how sequences work. If it didn't tend to zero, it wouldn't be in LP, right? P is less than infinity, of course, because I haven't defined C infinity. Uh, a useful way of computing this norm this definition that I gave up here, it's quite useful, but there's another useful characterization that maybe makes it, well, this to me is more clear. It's the trace that you can define a trace of an operator on a Hilbert space. It's the trace of the operator absolute value of U, which is an operator that you can define by the spectral theorem or by straight operator theory, raised to the power P, which again, you define through the spectral theorem because P might not be an integer. You take that trace, and you raise it to the one on p power. This is, I was going to say an equivalent norm. This is the same norm. This is true up to equality. And you see, this looks like the, <laughs> the classical LP norm, right? It's the inter it looks like the integral of the absolute value of a function to the p, except that this u now is an operator. So this guy defined by spectral theory. If you're not too familiar with spectral theory, just it lets you define functions of operators like this. So the space CP is the set of U such that absolute value of U to the P is trace class in particular. It has a trace, not every operator has a trace. Sometimes a trace is too big. I will also just quickly say that this absolute value of U can be written as U adjoint 
u to the one half. You take your operator u, multiply it by its adjoint out the front. That's going to be a positive operator and it's going to have a unique positive square root. And that's what that square root is. So this thing is positive and self adjoint. which lets you easily define the pth power through the spectral theorem because positive self-adjoint operators are very nice. We don't even need positive for that, but well, maybe you do, yeah. <laughs> My operator theory is also not fantastic. What else can we say? The space C1, so where this norm is, is the trace of the absolute value of U. This is just a set of trace last operators. On H. The C1 norm being finite says exactly that the trace is defined in finite. That's your trace loss. And C2 is the set of Hilbert Schmidt operators. So just going by the definition of the norm through the trace, this is the U such that the trace of U star U is finite. So operators u such that u star u is trace last. That's the Hilbert Schmidt operators. You can just take that as given. And you can define an inner product on the Hilbert Schmidt operators. The inner product of u and v is the trace of u v star. It's an inner product on C2. So C2 is a Hilbert space. So I said that these Schatten classes are generally not Banach spaces are generally not Hilbert spaces. When p equals two, you get a Hilbert space, but for other values of p, you don't. So you legitimately need some, some Banach space theory here beyond just Hilbert space theory to deal with these spaces. A couple other random properties that are going to be useful to have. Um, for all u, you have that the absolute value of u is actually the same as the absolute value of u adjoint. It's what happens when you construct this absolute value. So what this tells you is that the Schatten p norm of u is the same as the Schatten p norm of u adjoint. You should think of the adjoint as being like the complex conjugate of a function point-wise. And taking the complex conjugate and then taking the LP norm doesn't change the LP norm, does it? Doesn't change any absolute values. It can't change the LP norm. Same is true for operators with the adjoint. Uh, another random property that we need. We've got only two more random properties before I start actually proving things. We've got this definition in terms of the LP norm here, the, the sequence space LP. And you know that when P is less than Q, the sequence space LP is contained in the sequence space LQ. So the same is true for the Shatton classes. If P0 is less than or equal to P1, CP0 embeds continuously into CP1. Well, it's a containment. You don't really need to write this as an embedding. I can just write this. If that makes sense. So all of the Okay, I haven't defined C infinity. However, you define C infinity, whether you define it as the compact operators or the bounded operators, all of the Schatten classes are contained in that. But furthermore, C1 is contained in C2, C2 is contained in C3, and so on. And that'll be useful to us. And the final random property that I'm going to give you before we start proving anything is this, which I'm going to prove useful identity. Turns out to be quite useful. If you take the, the Schatten, 2p norm of an operator. And you write this out. So this is the trace of u star u to the 2p. Where does it? Yeah. So on the 2p on 2, because you have to take this u star u to the 1 half to get the absolute value. This is 1 on 2p. And you simplify that down. The spectral theorem says you can do this. p, 1 on 2p. And what this turns out to be, well, u star u is actually the same as absolute value of u star u because u star u is a positive operator and its absolute value is itself. And this is the Schatten p norm of u star u to the one half. <laughs> 
this is very, very useful. So if you just take the 2p norm of an operator, you can actually reduce that down to the p norm of this operator here, u star u. This, is a this has a corresponding property for functions. If you're taking the 2p norm of a function, then you can take the integral and you see you're taking a 2p power. You can take the function squared and it's a p power of that. So you can replace the L2p norm by an LP norm of the function squared. You can't do this sort of thing in general Banach spaces because you can't generally write out squares of vectors or whatever. But in this case of spaces of operators, you can compose operators. You actually have this multiplicative structure on these Banach spaces that you can use to relate them to each other. And we're going to exploit that later on today. So every time I say you can't multiply vectors, unless your vector space is a space of functions, unless your vector space is a space of operators, unless you have some actual additional structure on the Banach space that lets you do it. In this case, we have none. So we can use this. Okay, that's a bunch of random properties. Now, I just realized I lied to you. I said I was, that was gonna be the last property, last things I do without proof. I have more properties without proof. Maybe what I'll do is rather than giving you a bunch of random properties, I'll start going to the proofs. And when we need a random property, I'll tell you the random property. I think that's maybe a better way to proceed than literally just giving you a whole bunch of properties all at once that you'll forget. I want to make one observation though. There's no proofs here, nothing like that. This is all just something for intuition. These spaces of operators are actually examples of what are known as non-commutative LP spaces. in the language of non-commutative geometry and non-commutative analysis and so on, which this course isn't really about, but which is very interesting. You've got your sequence spaces LP and you've got these spaces of operators that are kind of thought of as the non-commutative analog of those sequence spaces. And you can see they're built off the sequence spaces of LP and they share a lot of the same properties. Actually, this is a special case of a more general construction of a non-commutative LP space. You write these as LP of A, and tau, where A is a von Neumann algebra. I hope not to scare you off if you don't know what a von Neumann algebra is, don't worry about it. And where this tau is a trace. So not the operator trace, but something more general called a trace. And when you have a von Neumann algebra and you have a trace, you can actually define something called the non-commutative LT space associated with that. Sometimes this data here a tau is called a non-commutative measure space. Of course, whenever you have a measure space, you can define a corresponding LP space. When you have a non-commutative measure space, you can define a corresponding non-commutative LP space. These are spaces of sort of generalized elements of the von Neumann algebra. I, I won't talk too much about them, but two examples you need to know. The example we just did is where the von Neumann algebra is all the bounded operators on the Hilbert space and where the trace is the classical trace. That gives you the Schatten classes as your non-commutative LP spaces. The other example is where you take a commutative von Neumann algebra, uh, the bounded operators, no, sorry, the bounded functions on a measure space. You can see that as being operators on L2. It gives you a von Neumann algebra structure. And your trace is the integral. And that gives you a, a commutative, non-commutative measure space. <laughs> and the non-commutative LP spaces associated with that are the LP spaces. <laughs> so actually this whole non-commutative LP theory includes the Shatton classes and classical LP spaces. So it's actually an extension of measure theory, but anyway, I'm not gonna say any more about that, just in case you're interested in operator theory and operator algebras in particular and stuff, then I know some of you are then this is where that goes. And by the way, these are all, whoops, these non-commutative LP spaces, they're all Barnack spaces. That's where the Barnack theory comes in. Okay. Let's prove some things. The most important theorem for us will be the following one. You can probably guess what the theorem is given what the course is about and given everything I've just said. For all P between one and infinity, not including one, 
there exists a constant C sub P less than infinity such that for all Hilbert spaces, including the finite dimensional ones, including the inseparable infinite dimensional ones, all Hilbert spaces, the Schatten class on H, CPH, is UMD. And furthermore, the UMD P constant of this space is bounded by this constant CP independently of H. So the Schatten classes, we defined their UMD spaces and the UMD constants actually don't depend on the choice of Hilbert space we started with. Of course, if you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, the, the constants are smaller, but there is a uniform bound for all Hilbert spaces. All right, so now you have to stop and think how are we gonna prove this UMD property of the spaces of operators? There are a couple of ways to do this. The, the thing you would think of as the most direct proof is to take all martingales valued in this Barnack space and try to show that their different sequences are unconditional. This is arguing by the definition. It's possible, you can prove it this way. You basically need to establish some non-commutative martingale inequalities for, for general non-commutative martingales, whatever they are. This really gets to the von Neumann algebra side of things. It works, but it's tricky. We're gonna do a proof through the Hilbert transform. We're gonna show that the Schatten class valued Hilbert transform actually has a vector valued extension. <laughs> is bounded on LP. We have Borgans theorem that says that that's enough to show the UMD property. So we're gonna prove it that way. So we prove this by showing that we're not actually gonna go directly through the, the real Hilbert transform. We're gonna use the Hilbert transform on the torus. Hilbert transform on the torus is bounded on LP of the torus valued in the Stratton class CB. And as I said in the previous lecture, I think that's enough to establish the UMD property. And we have to show that the constants don't depend on the Hilbert space, but we're gonna see that as a byproduct of the proof. We don't have to try harder for that, it just falls out. So how do we go about showing the Hilbert transform is bounded with respect to this well, valued in this Barnack space. And the trick ultimately, is to use this property here that lets you relate the Schatten class 2p to the p Schatten class. Somehow multiplicatively reduce p down. We're going to start with p equals 2, where we know it's a Hilbert space and therefore we know it's UMD. And we're going to induct. We're going to say if we know that cp is UMD, we know that c2p is UMD. And so by doing that, we're going to get all the powers p equals 2 to the n. And we're going to use some interpolation property that I'm going to pull out of nowhere to say that's enough to get all p greater than two. And then we're going to use a duality property that I'm also going to pull out of nowhere that's going to say this handles p less than two as well. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to use is the Kotler identity for the Hilbert transform. The Kotler's identity. for the Hilbert transform on the torus. And what's this identity? For all trigonometric polynomials, F and G on the torus, valued in the complex numbers. So just a scalar valued result here. If you take the Hilbert transform of F, torus Hilbert transform, times the Hilbert transform of G, and you subtract F times G, then this is the Hilbert transform of F times the Hilbert transform of G plus the Hilbert transform of F times G. Let me put brackets just to make clear what's where. Yep. We're not gonna prove this. It's an exercise in the notes. You can do it using the, the multiplier representation of this operator. Actually, we define this operator as a Fourier multiplier, so you have to do it that way. It's kind of like a product rule for the Hilbert transform. It's not exactly like the Leibniz rule. I think I stated it in the last lecture, but I stated it wrong. This is the correct one. Just have a bit of a stare at it for a bit just to get a feel for what's going on. I mean, I can't remember it either, but just to give you some idea, we're gonna come back to it. 
And one thing that we prove in the notes, but I'm not going to prove now just to save time, is that this scalar valued identity actually extends to any situation where you have some Barnack spaces and some bilinear operator mapping between them. So anytime you've got a multiplicative structure, this, th this theorem holds. So if you've got trigonometric polynomials valued in the bounded operators on a Hilbert space, This also holds. Where you interpret the multiplications as pointwise compositions of these operator valued functions. So if you have two functions, f and g valued, let's say if f and g map the torus to bounded linear operators, then f dot g is defined, f dot g of t for t in the torus is f of t, which is an operator composed with g of t. You can do that composition. That's what I mean by this pointwise multiplication in all of these. Up here, you've got quite a few pointwise multiplications. And you just do it in that sense, and it still holds. The proof is not hard. So I want to start proving that the these spaces are UMD, but I don't think I have time before the break. So what I might do is, can I give? I think let's just do the break now, come back to a longer second part, and then the timing is going to work out better. I don't want to split up this proof halfway through. Everyone okay with that? Start the early break. Ah, Kelvin's got a thing in the chat. The order you write Kotlar is important in the L of H case. Yeah. But you, everything's kind of symmetric, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, you mean the order in which we do these multiplications here? I guess. Yeah, that matters. Unless you swap everything systematically, then yeah. I mean, you can swap F and G and you've basically flipped all of the multiplications, but you can't flip them arbitrarily. So the order matters here. But I don't think it's too big of a deal here. As long as you write it like this, it'll work. 